Welcome to my show, Back to Basics, where I explore the human spine and attempt to make the complex simple. Hi there, I'm Joel Proskovitz, and welcome to my show, Back to Basics. I'm extremely excited to have you join me on this journey where I explore the wonderfully complex world of the lumbar spine and bring it to you, the viewer, in its most simple form. Please note that the content of this show is non-prescriptive. It is purely for information and entertainment purposes only. If you are currently dealing with low back pain, I urge you to seek out the guidance of a professional who is able to assist you. In this episode, I'm going to discuss a topic that I get asked many questions about, and that is what is the difference between a disc bulge and a disc herniation? So before I get into the specifics of disc bulges and all their variations, I'd like to orientate you to the specific area of the spine that I'm going to be focusing on. Now, using this model, I want you to imagine that this is a person standing up and you're looking at them from the right side of their body. So this is their tummy, this is their back. And in fact, if you took your finger and you ran it straight down someone's spine or your spine for that matter, you'd be feeling the back of these bones right over here. Now, this is a lumbar spine, so it's a, the lowest portion of the spine in your body. And this is the L4, and that's the L5 vertebra, or the bones. And you'll see between the L4 and the L5 vertebra is the L4, L5 disc. Using this model of the L4 and the L5, you'll see that the disc sits nicely tucked between those two bones and is actually quite tightly sandwiched right over there. Now, using this model, here's the disc again from the side. And if I turn it this way, you'll get to see that there's two very distinct features of the disc. You have this outer portion, which is lots of layers of collagen rings. And then inside, you've got this thickened gel-like substance. And in this case, we've dyed it blue just for demonstration purposes. And both the outer rings and the inner gel consists mainly of collagen. And that allows us to understand the disc's main function and that's to act as a ligament. And we know that ligaments connect bone to bone, so therefore, the primary function of that disc is to connect one vertebral bone to the other one, both above and below. The second function of the disc is based on the gel that sits in the middle of the disc. Now that gel has the ability to suck up water and lose water. And it sucks water up when you take load off your spine, for example, when you're lying down or when you're sleeping. And then as you walk around during the day and you put load through your spine, that disc loses a little bit of water and it loses its height. So the, that function allows the disc to maintain a certain height between those two bones. So if you never had gel inside of that disc, and if you never had a disc at all, literally those two bones, these two vertebrae would be sitting on top of each other and you wouldn't be able to then have the third function of the disc, which is to have movement in your spine. Because the disc allows you to move your spine forward, it allows you to bend it backwards, it allows you to move it from side to side and in all other directions. And then finally, the disc also acts as a minor shock absorber. So along with other structures in the spine, like the bone, when you run, when you jump, when you're doing any type of sporting activity, if you're putting any load through your back or picking up any, anything of significant weight, the disc and the bones have the ability to absorb all of that force and then dissipate that force. Before I show you a bulging disc, let's take a look at what defines a normal disc. So using this model, again, it's an L4 and an L5, and that's your L4, L5 disc, you will see quite clearly that the outer walls of the disc sit inside of the outer boundaries of the bone. And that 
occurs all the way through from the left to the, to the right and at the back. And that is what we would deem a normal disc. In contrast to that, this model clearly shows a bulging disc. And as you can see here, the outer wall of the disc has gone beyond the outer boundaries of those bones, all the way from the left to the right hand side and even at the back of the disc. And that is what we would term a disc bulge, is where it goes past the outer boundary of the bony walls and it covers a big surface area. So as you can see here, it is quite circumferential in its presentation. So it covers a greater surface area. A disc herniation, on the other hand, is very different to a disc bulge. And if I can direct your attention just to this portion of this model, you will see that if I create pressure and movement at the front of this joint, you will get to see how that disc herniates. The difference between a herniation and a bulge is that a herniation is far more focal, it's far more pinpoint, and it covers a smaller area compared to a disc bulge, which is bigger and more diffuse. Now, if you've ever had back pain and you've had to go for a scan like an MRI scan and you get a report, and that report says that you've got a disc prolapse. A disc prolapse is a very non-specific term. We don't quite understand what a prolapse is because disc herniations, as I demonstrated over here, they actually have subcategories. And there's three subcategories to disc herniations, and that is protrusions, extrusions, and sequestrations. The difference between a protrusion and an extrusion is essentially the size of the herniation. And then a, a sequestration is where this little red piece of gel, it will be, wouldn't be red in the human body, but it actually breaks off from the main disc and can sit directly in the middle of the canal. It can move up beyond or behind this bone. It can move down behind this bone and it can even sit just on the sides of the canal. So a disc herniation is far more specific, especially if we use protrusion, extrusion, and sequestration, than a disc prolapse, which is more nondescript and doesn't really give you a specific understanding of what's going on in the disc. The question is, can discs slip? Well, we need to take a look at the structure of the disc to understand as to whether it can or it can't. Now, we've determined, because of its collagen content, that the disc is actually a ligament and it connects one bone to another bone. And on the basis that it acts as a ligament, it's connected into the bone via very, very strong structures and fibers called Sharpie's fibers. And those Sharpie's fibers sit at the outer ring of the disc and they connect upwards into the bone and downwards into the bone below. They're very, very strong. And in fact, that tells you that a disc itself has no ability to slip or go anywhere. It can bulge and it can herniate, but it definitely can't slip. Very different though, is that the bone which sits above or below the, the, the disc, does have the ability to slip if it gets injured in a certain way. And we'll discuss that in a future episode. So in conclusion, disc bulges are diffuse and cover a big surface area. Disc herniations are far more focal and far more pinpoint, and they cover a smaller surface area. There's three types of disc herniations, there's protrusions, there's extrusions, and there's sequestrations, and discs can't slip. Anyway, I hope that was useful, and I hope it made uh, the understanding of disc bulges and disc herniations uh, a little bit more easier to digest for you. Thank you for joining me, and I look forward to sharing more simple explanations 
of the lumbar spine in future episodes.